Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. It's March, Women's History Month, dedicated to highlighting the contributions of women to society. It is celebrated in the United States, in the UK, and in Australia, and it corresponds to the International Women's Day celebrated on March 8th in many countries all over the world. Thus, it's the perfect time to find out more about women pioneers of the Theosophical Movement. Usually, when we talk about the women um, in the Theosophical Society, we talk about Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. She is one of the co-founders, together with Colonel Olcott and with William Kwan Judge. She founded the Theosophical Society in 1875. In a movie about another theosophist, Helma of Klint, who was a Swedish painter who expressed theosophical concepts in fantastic paintings. Somebody interviewed said that the Theosophical Society is a kind of women's liberation theology. And it gave women a license to access higher worlds. Another woman very often mentioned is Annie Besant. But today, I want to focus on three women who supported the Theosophical Movement and its leaders, gave to the movement in time, money, and work, and dedicated their life to serving humanity through the Theosophical Society. The first one I want to introduce to you is Countess Wachtmeister. She was a companion and co-worker of Helena Blavatsky from 1885 until Blavatsky's death in 1891. She lectured widely in the 1890s and she helped Annie Besant to form lodges in the United States. She was born as Constance Georgina Louis Urbel de Montpicon in Florence in Italy on March 28, 1838. Unfortunately, her parents passed away when she was very young and she had to move to England where she was raised by her aunt, Mrs. Buckley. In 1863, she married Count Wachtmeister, who was actually her cousin. He was a Swedish and Norwegian minister and in 1865, they had a son together, Count Axel Raoul. In 1868, her husband became the foreign minister of Sweden and they had to move there. But he died in 1871. Constanze Wachtmeister had actually psychic abilities. She was clairvoyant and clairaudient. And she had witnessed phenomena. And because of that, she was very interested in psychic research. So she started to do some exploration or um, got interested in spiritualism. But after two years, she gave up on it and said it was very dangerous. And eventually she encountered Theosophical uh, writings and joined the Theosophical Society on November 24, 1880, in Lund, Sweden. Soon after, I would say a few years after, actually, about uh, 1885, she really devoted her whole life and fortune to the service of Madame Blavatsky and her masters. She became a strict vegetarian 
and from then on she lived a simple life. She died on September 24, 1910 in Los Angeles. So here on the left we see a book where she wrote, writes about um, memories she had with H.B. Blavatsky and, um, while she was writing The Secret Doctrine. So she read Isis Unveiled and other theosophical books and really was interested in meeting Helena Blavatsky personally. And that happened in 1884 in London, but she didn't really talk to her. And then she got an invitation to go to Paris. And that's when Helena Blavatsky told her many things that nobody else knew. So she was completely caught off guard. And not only that, she told her, within two years, you will be devoted to the Theosophical movement. And Constanze Wachtmeister couldn't believe that. She rejected that idea. But Helena Blavatsky said, the master said so, and whatever they say is true. So Constanze Wachtmeister had uh, a few health issues and so whenever she could she spent time in a warmer climate and um, in 85 she went to, uh, to Germany to visit another um, theosophist uh, Mary Gephardt a German theosophist and who had uh, written letters exchanged letters with um, HBB and um, Mary Gephardt told her that uh, HBB was actually right now in Würzburg Germany working on the secret doctrine and felt a little bit lonely so uh, she suggested that Constanze Wachtmeister write to her and offer her services. And she got a letter from HPV that said, no, thank you. So she decided to just pack her suitcases and was in the middle of leaving um, for Italy when she got a telegram and it said, changed my mind, come. So she did. She went to Würzburg and then Helena Blavatsky immediately apologized and said, I'm very sorry. She said, my ways are not your ways. And I thought it wouldn't be appropriate to ask you to come. I have only one bedroom. But after I mailed the letter to you, the masters told me that I should uh, tell you to come. And so I put a screen in the bedroom. And from then on, they had to share this room, uh, this bedroom. And she entered HPV's household. She became an all around helper. She answered HPV's letters. And eventually she made copies of um, the uh, secret doctrine, like faith copies of the secret doctrine manuscript. In this book, she shared her first impression of HPV. She said her features were instinct with powers and expressed an innate nobility of character that more than fulfilled the anticipations I had formed. But what chiefly arrested my attention was the steady gaze of her wonderful gray eyes, piercing, but yet calm and inscrutable. They shone with the serene light which seems to penetrate and unveil the secrets of the heart. In this book, she also mentioned other attributes she admired. She was attracted to Blavatsky's indifference to praise or blame. And she said her sense of duty was not shaken by any selfish considerations. There were people who were critical of HPV back then already. And so there were, at the beginning, a few doubts she had, but she let them go. There were little things that happened that made her change her mind. For example, when she left uh, Sweden for Germany, a voice told her to pack a book, a uh, book with notes about the Tarot. And so she didn't understand why, but she did. And when she arrived um, at HBB's um, apartment, she said, the master is telling me that you have a book for me. And she said, I don't have a book for you. And she said, yes, he said, it's at the bottom of your suitcase. And so that's when she remembered the book. And one day she got a letter it had to do with her house in Sweden. And HBB, she didn't read the letter, but she looked at her and she said, I would advise you to sell this house now. But um, Constanze Wachtmeister disregarded her advice and paid for it later, she said. She had lots of um, issues. 
But once all the doubt was gone, she worked faithfully for HBB until her death. What I like about the book also, she gives us um, um, a countdown of Blavatsky's day, how she awakened, um, uh, was awakened by a servant at 6 a.m., how she sat at her desk at 7 a.m. She had breakfast at 8, and after that, the door closed mostly, and she was in her office working. And then the dinner bell rang at 1 p.m. They called it dinner there. Um, but she didn't always come out. When she was immersed in her work, she stayed there. At 7 p.m., the work ended, and then they had tea, pleasant evening. Maybe um, uh, HBB played a game of patience to rest her mind, but there was no theosophy talk allowed. Uh, allowed. And um, uh, uh, Constanze Wachtmeister always um, tried to find articles, magazines that she read to her. And at 9 p.m., um, she went to bed surrounded by Russian newspapers, reading till late. They shared other um, stories, and um, we get an insight when we read this book how HBB worked. She described to um, the Countess, I make a sort of vacuum in the air before me and fix my sight and my will upon it. And soon scene after scene passes before me like the successive pictures of a diorama or if I need a reference or information from some book, I fix my mind intently and the astral counterpart of the book appears. And from it, I take what I need. There are other things she shares in the book. For example, the um, messages that re she received from the masters and also how HPB got really sick and the doctor was convinced she would, she would die. But then overnight, um, she recovered with the help of the masters. After HBB um, passed away, she traveled to Adya. But then she moved to the US, lectured in Chicago and other places. And eventually she moved with her son to California to stay there. She visited every lodge of the TS and worked in a number of lodges to share her knowledge. She gave time, energy, and help financially. All could relied more and more on her. When she came to Adya, he appointed her president of the Women's Education League. He had formed that um, organization to further the education of Indian women. He formed the League of Theosophical Workers and Wachtmeister became its first president. And at the 1896 Adya Convention, um, he paid glowing tribute to Wachtmeister. She was really full of energy, very dedicated. And the quality that really spoke to me about her was her willingness to just give up her lifestyle and lead a simple life, and it cannot have been easy. She was not only appreciated by um, Colonel Alcott, um, but by others because she traveled from, uh, in 1894 and 1900 um, from coast to coast, many times lecturing, organizing, meeting people of all grades of society in her simple matter of fact way. And that was not that easy as today. Today, national speakers, now um, during the pandemic, uh, we meet um, uh, via Zoom, but um, before that, we would fly to a meeting or we would maybe take the train, train and, and, and drive. But back then, it was not as comfortable. The communication was not that easy, but she never complained. She gave everything she had. She also lectured in Europe, Australia, and in India, where she traveled with Annie Besant. I think together with um, Annie Besson, they visited 70 cities. On the left, you can see a certificate of appreciation found in the archives. It is from a branch in Australia. And they thank Countess Wachtmeister. And at the bottom, you can see the signatures of all um, the members who attended um, the lectures. 
She was an excellent writer in English and in French and edited Theosophical Siftings. She worked with Bertram Keatley to organize the Theosophical Publishing Society. And she also gave money for that. Um, uh, and in the Union Index of Theosophical Periodicals, 446 articles by or about her or her son are listed. There's one little story I wanted to share. Um, so Colonel Alcott had written his um, diaries and he wanted her um, to publish them. But there were passages about Helena Blavatsky she didn't, she didn't approve of. And so she said, I am not going to publish this unless you remove them, which he didn't. And then he found a different publisher. But it shows how uh, dedicated she was to HPV. She said, Theosophy is a free gift to humanity at large. And that in its influence on the current of modern thought, it must survive as a potent factor against the pessimistic materialism of the age. And reading that, it is clear to me why it was so important for her to disseminate um, theosophical teachings. The next person I want to introduce is Wanda Dinowska. Now, you might never have heard of her. She was a Polish theosophist, a writer, a translator, publisher, social activist, promoter of intercultural exchanges between India and Poland, and the founder of the English Polish Library. Now, around 2015, um, um, a movie was made about her. The movie is called Enlightened Soul, The Three Names of Uma Devi. She was known not only as Wanda Dinowska, but as Uma Devi, a name given to her by Mahatma Gandhi. And it means the bearer of light. And she was also known as Tenzin Chodon by the Tibetans, which means the keeper of the faith. So there is a preview of the movie. It's about 11 minutes long on YouTube, in addition to the trailer. But if you watch the preview, you will see an interview with our international president, Tim Boyd. He talks about the Theosophical Society and the three objects. And in the background, one can see the headquarters in Adya. She was born June 30th, 1888 in St. Petersburg. She was born, her parents were Polish. Her father was a lawyer. He seemed to have been pretty well off. There's not that much known about her young years. But at that time, Poland was not independent. Family owned a house on the countryside in Latvia, which must have been beautiful, surrounded by forests and a lake. And that house was open to everyone, to intellectuals, to politicians, to artists. And so she learned a lot about spiritual and Polish culture. She had private tutors. She must have been very talented when it came to languages too. Because she was fluent in Polish, German, French, Spanish, Italian and English, as well as Latvian. She also spoke Russian, the only when she absolutely had to. And later in life, she also learned Tamil and Hindi. So when she was young, she was uh, uh, exposed to theosophical books and to the um, doctrine of reincarnation. And she immediately took to it. She was raised Roman Catholic because the family was Polish. And so she was attracted to theosophy at an early age. She said, because it offered unlimited perspectives. Because life has neither beginning nor end. It is an everlasting creativeness, an inseparable attribute of the highest consciousness, God. She eventually went to meetings with Russian theosophists in Moscow, refused to speak Russian, 
<laughs> but they accepted it. But eventually she joined um, the Italian uh, section and she really was already then planning to establish a Polish branch, which became possible after World War I was over. So she moved to Warsaw and there were first talks about establishing a uh, Polish um, Theosophical Society. She pawned her jewelry, she received some donations, and she traveled to Paris to get Annie Besson's consent, which she did, but she did not meet Annie Besson's, Besson. Instead, she met Krishnamurti and was very impressed with him. So she, she fell in love um, during the war uh, with a young man. And I read somewhere that the family didn't approve of him, but they did get engaged. But he fell and died in the war. And she was grieving. But she didn't dwell on that grief. What she did, she became the founder and the guiding spirit of the Polish Theosophical Society. All her energy went into that. In 1921, she began editing the periodical Theosophical Review. And she also established um, the, an esoteric school. She invited Dr. Um, uh, George Arundel, who was the president of the uh, Theosophical Society in Adia back then, and his wife, wife Rukmini Devi, to Poland. They came actually twice. It was always a big uh, um, event, and then she had um, uh, new members. She participated in all European Congresses of the Theosophical Society. And this nucleus of the Universal Brotherhood was very important for her and guided her, this idea. So she also um, uh, founded the Polish Federation of the Order of Universal United Mixed Freemasonry. She organized the liberal Catholic Church and she became, she was interested in Rosicrucianism, as were other theosophists at that time too. So, in 1935, um, she decided to move to India. I'm not quite sure if she realized that it would be forever. She wanted to attend the Cong Congress of the Theosophical Society in India. And in the movie, it's implied that one of the reasons might have been that Marshal Josef um, Pilsudski died. He was the embodiment of the Polish nation, the first leader of the Polish Republic. And maybe his death made her think that she should search for her spiritual destiny. She immersed herself in Indian life at many levels, spiritual, intellectual, social, and political. And she met Mahatma Gandhi, who had been exposed to theosophy when he studied law in, in England and had um, attended meetings. And they exchanged letters. And there were some tensions because Marshal um, Pilsudski was a revolutionary had no problems with um, using weapons or more aggressive methods. But in the end, Gandhi was able to convince her to, um, uh, that nonviolent resistance is better and to have faith. She wrote articles for the American Theosophist. She studied yoga with Sri Ramana Maharshi. And in 1944, together with um, Maurice Friedman, she um, founded the Polish Indian Library and then an Indo-Polish library with Peter Jordan's book, First to Fight. She translated theosophical works into Polish. And she wrote a six volume Indian anthology. When World War II broke out, the Germans marched into Poland on September 1st, 1939. She was devastated, very upset, and she attempted to return to Poland to help 
her um, mother nation. But it was without success. She made it to Romania and that was it. But instead of grieving again, she turned her attention to Polish people who were able to leave the Soviet Union and reached India via Iran, Iran introducing them to Indian living conditions. And she was always drawn to uh, children. So um, especially at the beginning to the children from her beloved homeland and shared with them what she had. Serenity, a dedication to peace and respect for all cultures, and her knowledge of India. In 1960, again, because she really was drawn to children, she began working with Tibetan children who had lost their parents in the Chinese invasion and the passage across the Himalayas. And she was in permanent contact with the Dalai Lama. Now, um, he's interviewed in the movie too, but there is an additional interview that is found, um, can be found on um, YouTube for free because it was um, Uma Devi, he called her actually Matichi, the mother, who convinced him to be a vegetarian. And so he did try it, but then he had health issues and his doctors told him that he had to go back to the diet of his childhood, which included meat. Even at her death, she somehow manifested this concept that all religions are one. She had health issues and had moved to a convent in Mysore and uh, died there on March 27, 1971. She had asked that the last rites be um, recited by a uh, Catholic priest, which, which uh, happened. But the funeral rites were performed by Tibetan lamas. And Sri Ram, the fifth international president, spoke fondly of her and praised her at the 82nd and 96th International Convention. Umadevi always emphasized that it was not appropriate for others to follow her life's path, that she never played the part of a guru, and that she incessantly searched for the truth. The quality that spoke to me personally was this ability to overcome grief, and instead of dwelling on um, it, taking all the energy she had and put it into a project and gave it all she had. And the last person I want to talk about today is Dora van Gelder Kotz. She's better known. She was 95 when she passed away. She lived from 1904 till 1999. She was an American writer a psychic, a healer, and leader in the TS, serving as a tense president for 12 years. But she's also known outside of the Theosophical Society because she developed with Dolores Krieger therapeutic touch, and she developed methods for teaching it. She had a fascinating life, at least to me. She was born on a sugar plantation on the island of Java. This is today Indonesia, but back then it was known as the Dutch East Indies. Now, both her parents were also very involved in the Theosophical Society. Her mother actually was the um, president of the local lodge. And it was her mother who told her that she should start to meditate at the age of five or six. At the beginning, she gave her little tasks. She had three younger brothers. She was tutored at home. She spent a lot um, um, of time outside in nature. She read theosophical writings early in life. She was exposed to theosophists all the time because there were um, meetings even at, her, at, at, at the home. Her Oma, that's the grandmother, um, started to live with the family after her husband passed away. And she was a herbalist 
herbalist. And um, actually she was known in the area. There were not many medical doctors. And when people had um, health issues, they turned to her so that they would help her heal with herbs. She was very intuitive, even at a young age. And she had clairvoyant abilities. When she was around six or seven years old, Charles Leadbeater, another theosophist and a contemporary um, uh, um, of Annie Bess, and, and, he, and he worked very closely with her, came to Australia and was very impressed with her abilities. And when um, Dora von Gelder was about 12 uh, years old, um, Leadbeater decided that he would like to um, create a school for the children of um, theosophical families. And so he asked her to come to Australia. And um, she went first with her aunt, um, who was the ship, chaperone. But the residential settings were really not set up for any girls. It was mostly, uh, it was all boys until 1920. And then um, there were more girls there. But um, so she had to return. But then uh, Leadbeater developed health issues and Annie Besson found a female doctor for him. And she um, uh, was in Australia and became then the chaperone. So that's when um, Dora returned to Australia. So when Leadbeater suggested that she come, the parents told her that it's her decision that she should go and meditate on it and they would accept whatever she decides. Which was a huge thing for a girl of 12 years old. And she said, it was a very decisive moment. By God, it changed my life totally. I was never a child again in one way I learned independence. I mean, if you are alone in a foreign country, you either break or fall apart. I don't know what my life would have been or not have been. I can't tell you. But I chose it, not my parents. Incredible, at least for me. So um, there were many things um, that could be shared, but I wanted to um, focus on, on two things that happened in, um, in Australia. One was the letters um, that she had to write. So Leadbeater gave um, lectures about life after death. And because of these lectures, he received a lot of inquiries regarding the well-being of loved ones. And then during World War I, there was Gallipoli, a lot of young um, Australians died, and the inquiries just increased. But he did not feel well, and he was just not in the position to answer them all. So he went to 14-year-old Dora and he said that she should clairvoyantly locate those who had died and then write letters to families. So this forced her to, first of all, develop her clairvoyant abilities even further, but also to improve her English because she didn't know much, uh, um, any English when she moved to Australia. There was a secretary who helped her write the letters. She also had to perceive death from other cultural and psychological perspectives. And it took a lot of thought um, to know how to respond to these families. And she admitted that it was emotionally challenging. She did it for several years. Another thing that was important to her were young theosophists. So there was a young man there. His name was Oscar Kolderstrom. Um, and in 1922, they, they uh, founded the Young Theosophist Group. She was, he was the head and she became the secretary. But after Oscar had decided to move back to Europe, she became the president of the Australian Federation of Young Theosophists. She wrote articles for the Journal of the World Federation. She helped organize camping trips for the youth groups. And when she found out about the suffering 
uh, overseas. She helped raise funds to send food to theosophists in Russia who were struggling after the war. She had very um, good clairvoyant abilities. They must have been very um, advanced. And when she was young and spent time outside, she became aware of the Deva realm at a um, and she said that devas transmit and direct energy to nature. So she decided to teach a class on clairvoyance, which she called an additional sense. She also studied those devas um, and um, took notes and wrote a manuscript in 1937, which was not published till 40 years later, called The Real World Affairs. Fritz Kunz was another theosophist. He was the youngest of 12 children. Not all of them survived. He had uh, several older sisters. Um, and he came to Australia to um, support uh, the theosophical uh, movement. And she met him in 1922. He was 16 years older than her. And um, a few years after that, uh, she had, she injured herself. It was a horseback riding um, um, accident and she was in pain. And so he recommended that she go to the United States and try to find somebody who can heal her. And she did. She found a blind osteopath and she said who could see energy fields and feel with his hands. And they were even active then before they were married. Both of them gave talks at the convention in 1925 and they eventually got married. And they were married from 1927 till um, 1972. They had a son, John, who was born in 1928. Fritz was a brilliant speaker and educator. And he traveled a lot. He was also a dedicated theosophist. And so she had a very busy life with Fritz's work. And they first lived in Seattle and were active in the lodge there. And then they, um, I think they were asked to move to New York and um, were active in that lodge. Dora never saw herself as an unequal partner, but she did not want that anything interfered with Fritz's work. She did attend workshops and um, did things that interested her. But she came into her own after her husband passed away. Together with Dolores Krieger, and we see here a picture on the, li um, on the uh, left, on the bottom, on the left is Dolores Krieger, and on the right is Dora Kunz. Um, uh, so Dolores Krieger was a nursing professor at the New York University. And so they were interested to um, come up with an alternative healing method. They said their therapeutic touch is a holistic evidence-based therapy that incorporates the intentional and compassionate use of universal energy to promote balance and well-being. And since 1972, it has been taught in more than 80 colleges and approximately 90 countries. And it is taught till this day. Now, alternative healing wasn't that um, uh, big in the 1970s as it is today, over 50 years later. And so there were critical um, articles uh, written about it, but it did not uh, matter. It is still um, used today. She had a very highly developed sensibility. She was able to perceive blockages in a patient's energy field, subtle disharmonies not accessible to other med medical technologies. So she worked with other um, people in the, in the medical field. She never took any money. And of course, she, she uh, was not a healthcare worker, so she wasn't allowed to do anything, but she worked with them together and help them to um, 
uh, find the right approach, um, medical approach or medicine. She diagnosed numerous perplexing cases referred by physicians and other scientists and often suggested treatments and resources for her patients. Now, this is a book she published in 1989, and she wrote it together with um, Dr. Caragula, The Chakras. I have a copy. I am fascinated by um, the chakras and the energy fields. And um, so she describes in that book how clairvoyance can see etherical, or vital, or astral and, or emotional and mental energy fields, and that they surround and penetrate every cell of the body. She explains that chakras reveal a person's quality of consciousness and degree of personal development and abilities. And she emphasizes that self-regulation throughout nature is achieved from within and that we have the ability to replenish our energy without an outside agency. For her, this, um, all this was very excited. She, was, she felt like it was the dawn of a new era because it provided the in, uh, ability to, to integrate medical science with an investigation of the subtler aspects and energy of human personality. So this is another book I have, The Personal Aura. I love it. It has 19 colors illustrations done by a, um, uh, an artist based on what Dora um, von Gelder could, could see. And she describes the personal aura in the book, um, and that again, that human beings are immersed in energy fields, and that this is actually consistent with theosophical Hindu and Buddhist teachings. And she, again, in this book, emphasizes that within everyone lies the potential insight, strength, and will for change. And that we have to understand that change is possible. She said, because, so this is, um, this is the picture um, of a 50-year-old man. It's on the cover page, but it's actually illustration number 11. And um, so she describes um, uh, him and says, because he um, has a strong character, the um, um, aura is clear, and there is a depth of colors. He was an activist a social environmental activist. Um, she pointed out, for example, I don't know if you can, I hope you can see this, the yellow here um, uh, is, uh, in indicates that the fine intellect. And then the green um, in implies empathy and compassion. Um, um, the pink, genuine altruism. The lavender, that he's a spiritual person. And then she points out this blue at the bottom that encases the auric egg. And she said that shows that um, uh, the man is under a lot of pressure. Um, she also said that the colors of the, the aura is very well balanced. And there's one more thing that I want to point out, and that's this red orange bloom at the bottom right next to the um, uh, leg, and that implies intellectual pride. And when this man saw this, he understood it and he immediately worked on it to get rid of that. So reading these um, interpretations are very, very interesting. And this is another book that I have, A Most Unusual Life. I have read this numerous times because when you read it, you realize the Dora von Geller Kunz affected the lives of thousands of people through her books, lectures, seminars, articles, workshops, and healing treatments. She was a national speaker and she was president for 12 years. And she became president at the age of 71. Um, she really had didn't want to work on the national level or become president, but um, other theosophists that urged her to run, and she was elected. 
And there are lots of um, accomplishments during her time. Um, and if anybody's interested on the Theosophical Wiki, you can read, there is a whole list of what she did and what was taken care of during the time. Even before she was president, she and her husband were instrumental in creating the Theosophical Retreat Centers, first in Dalaya on Orcas Island in 1927. And then they wanted to have a, um, uh, another retreat center on the East Coast. And so they um, found a place and created Pumpkin Hollow in New York in 1936. Meditation was incredibly important for her. She believed that it can calm us down, but that if we meditate regularly, we can develop insight. I remember when I read the book the first time, she recommended that um, anybody who has the opportunity to have a meditation room, um, that that would be helpful. And when my younger son moved out, my husband helped me to create a meditation room, which has become my sanctuary. I'm there every morning and every night. And um, I feel it, it has helped me a lot. She also um, ran healing workshops and healing groups. There's one thing I want to point out. Um, we teach the doctrine of re reincarnation and theosophy. And we, we distinguish between personality and individuality. And the personality is, personality is the temporal aspect of us. For example, Susanna Hopeful Wellenhofer in this life. But the individuality is the higher mind and the causal body. But every time we incarnate, first of all, we have a different dharma. We have to learn something specific in each life. But we have to align with the personality. And that is not always easy. And Dora was a complex person. She was on the one hand a spiritual giant thoroughly dedicated to the masters who inspired the theosophical movement. She was altruistic, loving, compassionate, and had a great sense of humor. But on the other hand, she had a difficult personality. She was very direct. And she was a micromanager. And her personality sometimes led to tensions. And this is one of the things that I feel is so important for us to remember um, and to be compassionate to everyone because we have our tasks that we have to work on in this particular life. We cannot focus on everything. She died in Seattle on August 25th, 1999, after being a member of the TS in America for 80 years. And there are many friends who wrote memoirs describing her warmth and compassion, energy, practicality, and the infectious spontaneity of her laughter. And in this book, um, An Unusual Life, at the end, the last few pages are dedicated to this um, memorials by people who have um, known her. She, um, Dora Kunz was a person with the quality that, um, with many good qualities, but the quality that spoke to me personally was not only that she had, she was very intuitive, but she trusted um, her intuition at a very young age. And that is for me um, phenomenal. Compassion was a unifying force for these three women that I introduced today. Countess Wachtmeister, the woman who was called Uma Devi, and Dora van Gelder Kunz. They spent most of their life in altruistic commitment to the wellness of human beings. And they found a way to support the Theosophical Movement, a community that's, or a community that's dear to them and to serve humanity in general. These women not only led by example, but they provide examples on how we can support the Theosophical um, Society or a community dear to our heart. The qualities I mentioned and that speak to me personally might not be the same qualities that speak to you. We all have the same goal, but we all have a different Dharma 
and thus a different path. But I hope these women inspire you as much as they inspire me. Thank you and good night.